Good day. Welcome to the American Security Council Foundation Peace Through Strength podcast. I'm delighted today to have as our guest Lieutenant Commander Amir Pishtad Jr., who's going to talk about his experiences and why he joined the United States Navy as a SEAL team member. Welcome, Thank Amir. you. Thank yeah. you, Larry. Thank yeah. you. So we've had a few chats. Yes, sir. And uh, uh, Amir is also... Uh, involved in the Military Officers Association of uh, Cape Canaveral, which I'm also a member. So I've, I've heard him talk on that. And he's uh, spoken before the Association of Former Intelligence Officers on his experiences. But I never tire of hearing him, and you always have something else to say. So, Thank you. Thank you. So uh, why don't you just briefly tell our listeners and viewers uh, the reason why uh, you decided to become a SEAL when you were just a, a lad? Yeah. When I was a young young man in uh, in high school, um, I got influenced by watching this television show called Sea Hut with Lloyd Bridges starring as Mike Nelson and act and uh, a ex UDT frogman and doing all these great underwater adventures. Of course, at the same time, Lloyd uh, Jacques Cousteau was also doing his adventures, and and I I said I want to do underwater something with underwater in my life. And I had a chance to watch several times the uh, black and white movie called The Frogman with Dana Andrews and Richard Winmark, in which uh, as, you know, as frogmen, they operate on the submarine and they did some reconnaissance on beaches and blew up. And one of the most intriguing things is, is that they jumped off these high speed boats and got picked back up called, called Cast and Recovery. <laughs> and I said, boy, if I could ever get a chance to do something like that, and all those experiences kind of stuck in the back of my mind while I was learning to scuba dive. And a short time later, I um, got a chance to watch the, some of the first James Bond movies. And where James Bond was working with all types of explosives, he was shooting all types of weapons, he was driving fast cars, he was doing all these great adventures of underwater with submarines and self-propelled devices yeah. underwater. Yeah was skydiving um, and he was coming ashore in his wetsuit, taking off his wetsuit, becoming a, and a, going to the casino in a tuxedo and, and had all these beautiful women around him. And I said, can you imagine there's really something like that in real life? <laughs> and lo and behold, they're called Navy Frogmen, Navy Seals. <laughs> <laughs> so you live the dream. I live the dream. Okay. You know, the Navy has a saying, uh, it's not just a job, it's an adventure. <laughs> and, yeah. and I will tell you, for the 20 years I was privileged to serve, it was indeed an adventure. Yes. But to get to become a SEAL is just not that easy. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the history of the training program of the initially it was UDT and then became SEALs. Right. Well, right short where we're actually sitting right now is Fort Pierce, Florida. And on Fort Pierce, Florida was then a naval amphibious base in which uh, then Commander Kaufman, who had been recruited as an academy grad, went to England, became an expert in demolitions, was brought back into the United States, and he was given the task to train men to go on the beaches of Normandy. One year to the day of the landing on December, on June 4, uh, June 6, 1944. So in 1943, um, uh, the training was started. And during this process of training men using members from the OSS, which today is called the CIA, and using members from the Army called the Scouts and Raiders, they trained these young men to become Naval Combat Demolition Units, also called NCDUs. You know, we have a lot of acronyms in the military. Yeah, yeah. And uh, SEAL actually is an acronym. Mm -hmm. It stands for Sea, Air, and Land. Oh, and UDT right. stands for Underwater Demolition Team. Well, in the latter part of 1943, uh, due to the unfortunate incident that occurred in Tarawa, where the Marines were doing their amphibious landing for island hopping, uh, they lost a lot, about 1,500 Marines. Yeah. Either to drowning in deep water where the landing craft didn't uh, wasn't anticipating a high coral, uh, or they were shot by the Japanese trying to swim to shore. And, uh, and, and came from the higher ups, they had said, well, we need someone who has underwater experience for, to do uh, littoral checking of the, the beaches, looking for an approach, someone that can have demolition experience to go in and can um, 
can clear p passages for the landing craft and they can operate like a team. And Commander Kaufman said, well, I have just those guys. We'll call them the underwater demolition teams. And so in 1943, the underwater demolition teams were created. And, um, and then it evolved eventually at one point up to 30 teams. But um, and when I joined the Navy at that time, which was 1973, but by the time I got to the teams of training uh, in January 1975, we were down to three teams, Underwater Demolition Team 11 and 12, which were located in Coronado, California, and Underwater Demolition Team 21, located in Little Creek, Virginia. And I was assigned to Underwater Demolition Team 21 as a, an E2, Seaman Apprentice, right out of BUDS. <laughs> BUDS is? BUD stands for Basic Underwater Demolition Seals. Okay. And so it's the bread and butter to teach you all the basics of the underwater demolition. And later uh, in the 70s, uh, well, in the 60s, when they, uh, John F. Kennedy commissioned SEAL Team 1 and SEAL Team 2 on January the 1st, 1962, um, they changed it to add the S for SEALs. And they started training in land warfare and more demolition training on land and more weapons training. And so when the graduates finished that training, they were could be assigned to either, at the time, one of the three underwater demolition teams or one of the two SEAL teams. Okay, so you're a young man, you join the Navy as an enlisted man, and then what happened? You go, you go through the SEALs or you just do the Navy and then later you join the SEALs? Uh, no, I, I, I went right from boot camp in 1973 in August. Uh, volunteer to take the test uh, that allowed you to be qualified to go to the UDT training. Um, from boot camp went to SEAL training, uh, UD, BUDS training, and after BUDS training, then I went to Underwater Demolition Team 21. And I served there. Uh, eventually, I was assigned to SEAL Team 2, both in Little Creek, Virginia. And then I got out and went to College of Virginia Commonwealth University, 1977. So how long was the uh, training for UDT SEAL? Well, it was six months long then <laughs> for the basic course in which you earned your, the Navy SEAL Trident, which sported right there and again right here on my chest. So we're talking about this here? Uh, th this is the Trident right, right here. There. Right here. Okay. And um, this happens to be uh, the emblem that we have for the Navy SEALs that are part of what's called the Frogman Motorcycle Club. <laughs> and we have a saying in the teams, long live the brotherhood. Yeah, okay. So would you explain the, 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 uh, the symbol? Uh -huh. Well, <clears throat> when the uh, uh, underwater, when the Naval Combat Demolition Unit started back in 1943 and the underwater demolition teams, they had to borrow and steal uniforms from the Marine Corps and from the Army um, and, and uniforms because there was no specific uniform for the type of missions that we were accomplishing. So they kind of beg and borrow and stole from the different branches. And when I went through training, we wore the Army fatigues with the Marine Corps eight-point hat that was starched. And, um, and eventually the, the teams evolved to the camouflage units. So they did not have any type of insignia that represented who they were, just a bunch of renegades wearing these odd-looking clothes and sometimes just shorts uh, on the beach. And uh, over a period of time, they developed a special type of shirt, which was two-sided, gold on one side and blue on the other, which happens to be the navy colors, blue and gold, uh, to promote teamwork. And we would do a lot of the activities where we'd have two different teams, the blue team and the gold team. Gotcha. And so we would actually <clears throat> switch our shirts off depending on what team you were on. It promoted camaraderie, it promoted the teamwork, and it co made a very cohesive type of yeah. operation. So, okay. uh, so the trident is what we refer to, or sometimes we call it the Budweiser, <laughs> is uh, it started out originally with three components. And the first component was the Navy anchor. It's an old anchor which represents tradition of the Navy. There are a lot of things in the Navy that are still base everything they do and their, their, their background is based on tradition. And, and, and that's very important because as you know in military history, we always have to never forget the past. So we have an anchor, which is the old Navy anchor. And then we have a flintlock pistol. And this flintlock pistol in the cock position, meaning we're always ready, it stands for 
representing those members of the OSS, the saboteurs back in the Revolutionary War, and then come up today to where we do that type of mission. Um, then third item that was on the Trident was called the uh, Neptune Spear. It's got three points and it stands for honor, courage, and commitment. And that was the underwater demolition team uh, when they finally came out with one. However, they made a gold for the officers and pewter, silver color, for the enlisted. And when it came time that they eventually added SEAL Team 1 and SEAL Team 2 in 1962, sometime after that event, they decided to add the Eagle. And what's unique about the Eagle, it's the only insignia that involves an Eagle in the Armed Forces that the Eagle is not looking up proudly, but it's looking down. And it's not to be discouraged. It's look. It knows the country knows that we wear our trident right here on our chest, and it knows that we don't serve our country for a living, but Navy frogmen, Navy SEALs live to serve our country. And so we have the SEAL trident, which is proudly worn <clears throat> by every Navy SEAL. And being a Navy SEAL is not easy. So the training program, you were, your class was unique at the time. Uh, yes. What class number was that? Class 80. Class 80. And the year was? Uh, we graduated in January 1975. Okay. And what's so unique about Class 80? Class 80 started with 59 guys. Uh, we had 40 dropouts in the first two weeks, and Hell Week was the third week. And generally, you start counting guys that drop from Hell Week on. And Class 80 is not only what's referred to as a Nobel Hell Week, which no one quit of the 19 men that were in our training class, which included one Peruvian officer. Of the, of the 19, all 19 of us not only finished the training, but we also graduated training with the six roll-ins from the class 79 behind us who had injuries. So we're the only class that never quit, that everyone that started Hell Week made it to the end of training. While there have been a few other classes that have no Bell Hell Weeks, Every class, all of those classes, lost people after training. No bell. There's a, there's a bell at the training. Oh, I'll tell you. Is there a bell? This bell is, some, is today they travel wherever you go. They, they bring it to you, so make it quitting is easy. But the <laughs> bell, rec, bell signifies um, that you want to drop out of the program. You want to drop on request. And so to signify this, to let the instructors know that you're quitting, you go up to the bell and you ring it three times very loudly. Now, sometimes you might walk up to the bell and ring it once to get the attention of the instructors that you're there for the next assignment. But if you ring it three times, three times. you're out. And so you might have seen images, which we'll probably post a few here on, on this podcast, of the line of helmets that are typically right beside the bell. I've, I've seen them over 50 helmets or more have been lined up and for subsequent classes after mine. Oh. Oh. So how hard is it? Yeah. How, how, how? <laughs> well, we do have a saying, the only easy day was yesterday. But uh, I have come up with a phrase that I think is very motivating, that you can apply to anything in life. And it's only as hard as you make it. Because it's all about you, your focus, your self-belief in yourself. And of course, that thing that'll bite you in the butt, it's called attention to detail. Now, I mean, you told me the story about attention to detail, about uh, dropping out, and, and some, uh, the detail was when nobody drops out of the name, the, there was a catch on the name. Well, you know, um, one of the things that you have to do in this training is uh, they have uh, instructor-led runs. That's it. And, if you, and uh, those who fall behind on these runs will find themselves in the glorious thing called the goon squad. And it's... It's just about what it is, pretty glory. It's pretty non-glorious type of training. But you'll get out in the ocean, you'll reach almost hyperthermic conditions, you'll roll in the sand, and you'll probably do endless, endless push-ups. But during this process, uh, particularly when in our class, when they make everybody think that you didn't do well. And so you're all in the push-up position, and they'll come up to you, and the instructor, after maybe doing about 80 push-ups, and everybody's still in the lean and rest, but your feet are perched up on a, a, a little, little hill of sand. So all the weights on your forward arms and your back. And the instructor will say, gentlemen, no one's getting up until somebody quits. 
Well, I'm here to tell you that our names are stamped right across our shirts. And there isn't one single person there whose name is somebody. So it's mm -hmm. attention to detail. No one's getting up until somebody quits. They didn't say no, not, no one's getting up until <laughs> Pishtag quits or, or Johnson or one of the other members of my class. Yeah. It's about somebody quits. And so I looked at it as <laughs> they're not talking to me. <laughs> so, but and details matter. Detail is extremely important, no matter what you do in life. That's true. And um, as I've come to work with different individuals from different branches of service, especially those in the special operations field, it doesn't matter which field you're in, uh, and even it doesn't matter in and uh, working with members of the CIA, working with members of other parts of our government that are not necessarily in the military, but correspond with you. Yeah. It's everything. It is everything that will m determine whether or not the mission fails or succeeds. And also your attitude. I, I was always impressed with the attitude that uh, your teammates encouraged everybody so that no one wanted to drop out and disappoint the others. Um, well, I don't know. It's Disappoint is the right word. Well, well, you know what? When you get to a point and you you create a cohesive team, in our class, we started Hell Week on Sunday night, shortly after midnight. And here we are now, six and a half days later on Saturday. Normally, five and a half days is when they use to secure you. But again, we're, we're a class that so far no one's quit. And the instructors just want to make sure that this class is as cohesive as it possible. And so they told us that we're starting Hell Week again on Saturday. And so we ended up starting Hell Week again, a little different, but we paddled nine miles. Uh, eventually we got down to the, near the mud flats between the United States and Tijuana, Mexico, and uh, where we were met by a friendly agent who then told us that we were secured, that we passed. But they wanted to test the, the you know, you're, you maybe had four hours sleep the whole week. Yeah. And you're exhausted, and and uh, and you're wet, and you're cold, and you're tired, and you're miserable. But they want to test whether or not you can just persevere, and so that's where it really comes out. And our our three boat crews, the 19 guys, we were so tight that nothing was going to penetrate our motivation, our enthusiasm, and our drive to work together as a team. And no one was going to quit. Yeah. And I, I would uh, note that the, when we're talking about San Diego, California training, the water off of San Diego is what, 58, 59 degrees? Well, 50, around 57, 59 yeah. degrees and, at any given time. Plus the sand, and you get the sand in your clothes all over your body. Well, and... the, key, the key to hypothermia is time and the temperature of the water. You can get hypothermia right here off the coast of Florida in 80 degree water. It just depends on how long you've been in, in the, the water. water. And in San Diego, it doesn't take long for your body to get so chilled that it starts to break down, starts to yeah. shut down. Yeah. So um, the training is so in, so precise and so intent and so well monitored, they know precisely where the point is that the body can with, with, withhold that. Unfortunately, a lot of guys, their minds don't follow the same type yeah. of rule. Yeah. And so they end up quitting. Yeah. You gotta have the will to, to succeed, and not only in the SEALs, but in other things too, and discipline. Yes, sir. You know, talking about positive attitude, uh, I've had the privilege of uh, mentoring to uh, some different guys that had gone to SEAL training and have actually been invited to speak to a, a recent class a couple years ago in Coronado. And I asked them about that, that picture, which I hope will show, is a picture of guys in the surf zone, arm in arm, and the waves breaking over top of them. And I said, no, no, what is that called? And the group of people there, they're, they're mumbling, well, that's called surf torture. And I have to shake my head and I'm going like, you see guys, you're not understanding what it really means to be positive attitude. That is not called surf torture. It is called surf appreciation. <laughs> and if you think about it being surf torture, you've already beaten yourself up before you even get in the water. So those of you who call it surf torture, you'll quit first. <laughs> No doubt. Appreciation. Yeah. Yeah. It's surf appreciation. And where else can you go in Southern California, arm in arm with some of the greatest athletes are in this country, men who are determined that they see the vision of themselves becoming Navy SEALs. And they're working hand in hand with these other great guys. Many of them, uh, we've had Olympic athletes, we've had professional uh, ball players, we've had uh, uh, scholars in, in colleges. 
And speaking of college, a large percentage of those trainees that are coming in today who probably could qualify for a commission, but because there's so few officer slots in this training, they come in as enlisted, but they're highly educated. They're smart kids. But it's not about just being smart. It's about being focused on your, what you think. So what is the ratio of officer to enlisted? Uh, I would say, in a, just to give you an example, uh, the teams back then, we basically had about a um, close to maybe a 100, 115 men, maybe 15 officers, 100 enlisted. But in the platoons that we generally put, operate in my day, um, we were generally operating with two officers and um, uh, 14, uh, 12 to 14 enlisted men. So it's a, it's a very, very cohesive unit and you had to put your trust in the other individual. I was gonna say, the officers couldn't be doing too much on the uh, pulling rank with a bunch of uh, enlisted SEALs, I wouldn't think. No, it's not, it's <laughs> not, about, um, it's not about the rank. There's people yeah. that have to make decisions and that we give them the senior enlisted, the chief that consults with the officers and, um, and everybody in the platoon has an input in planning a mission. Because we're all gonna go in together and uh, I mentioned something about the, the different colors yes. of the trident. That brings me to the point that now all the tridents are gold because both enlisted and officers go through the same training. So you both qualified together. So it was decided to keep the cohesive type of, of atmosphere that everybody wore the same color of trident. Yeah. Yeah. And it's still today. So th when I graduated in, in January 1975 from my training class, um, we all had gold tridents. And so it, it was already gold probably in the early 70s. So, you, so after you, your initial tour with the Navy, you, you left the Navy to go to college? I went to college for two and a half years, Virginia Commonwealth University. I graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree. And three Fridays before I got my degree, was qualifying the last class. Uh, Captain Dick Marcinko, former SEAL Team 2, uh, was uh, tasked by the Pentagon, the Navy, to put together a special team. And he came to me and asked me to, he wanted me to be in his new unit. Pretty much pretty much said, I, I want you to go with me right now to the Pentagon. You'll be in my Navy this afternoon. And uh, I told Captain Marcinko that, that I have three Fridays, I'll have my college degree, but I'll go with him right now. I would be willing to do anything, anywhere, anytime. And he said, I was hoping you would say just those words. He said, let's go to the Pentagon. And I said, well, Captain, um, you know, three Fridays from now, I'll have my degree. And he thought about it. And um, he's got his arm around me, and he says, I want you to go back to school, put your paper in for commissioning. Finish the degree, I'll take care of it. And uh, two, less than two Mondays later, I have orders for that Friday that I finished my last class. I'm, I'm reporting Officer Candidate School, Newport, Rhode Island. And from there, I went to Underwater Demolition Team 11, and I became... The dream that I really wanted to be, I became the diving officer of the underwater demolition team 11. Besides later becoming a platoon, assistant platoon commander um, and a, a various other assignments while I was there. So how did Machenko know you? Well, you know, you got the name Amir Pishdad. It's a Persian background. And, uh, you know, I'm always been told that you work really hard no matter what you do in life. People will seek you out they hear about your reputation and how your work ethic and your attitude. And I believe that uh, Marcinko found out about me and wanted me to come back. So to you hadn't served with him previously? Never either. served and, with him at all. But you but, had heard of him. But I very much heard of him oh, and, yeah. uh, and uh, respected his, his, uh, his attitude, his, his, uh, um, his positive uh, influence in the teams. And he has his vision of creating then SEAL Team 6 has totally changed and uh, influenced how the Navy SEALs operate today, whether they're working under the, the special command that SEAL Team 6 has been changed to, or you're working in the teams. Things that we do today, we've been doing for the past couple wars, are all because of Captain Marcinko, his initial influence in changing how we do, do our missions. And so in, in, in present service, in present day Navy, roughly how many SEALs are there? You know, I was reading something on the internet today, and I would say anywhere between 25 to 2,800. 
Well, for a very small number, they certainly have an outsized impact on uh, operations, that's for sure. Well, they operate just about everywhere in, this in the world today, yeah. and they're always postured to, to uh, take on whatever the challenge is. And usually succeed, <laughs> at least we hope anyway. Failure is not an option. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Now, SEAL, did they take out Osama bin Laden? Uh, yes, sir. It was uh, SEAL, members from SEAL Team 6 were tasked with the mission of training and carrying out the mission for Osama bin Laden. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. How about a plug for the SEAL Museum down at Fort Pierce? Down at Fort Pierce. Well, <clears throat> the land where the training started back in 1943 has been cultivated and, and they created a museum. And today it's it's more than size and double, but it honors those that serve in the Naval Combat Demolition Units, the underwater demolition teams and SEAL teams. And um, there's also a memorial. So we have a special wall that, that dedicated to naming every man that ever was killed in combat or combat training. And the museum itself is constantly evolving to where they have uh, gone from the very beginning back in World War II to current day operations. And it's a very well laid, laid out operation. We've got an excellent staff, um, two of the uh, uh, top members of the staff that are full time are, are both um, uh, members, former SEAL Team 6, or which today is called Dev Group, Development Group. Um, and we have a, a board of directors that is composed of uh, uh, primarily of, of former Navy SEAL underwater demolition team members. Okay. And keep in mind now, it's been, uh, as we're sitting here today, and. Uh, 2024. This May will be four, will be 81 years since the underwater demolition teams were created, and it'll be 41 years since they were disbanded. So when I was privileged to be an underwater demolition team 21, in May 1st, 1983, our team became SEAL Team 5. So I was privileged to be a plank owner, which is a member of a original Navy command, and primarily tasked the name came from being planks on ships, wooden ships. Remember, it's all about tradition. Yeah. And so uh, every member of an original Navy command is called a plank owner, whether it's a carrier, a frigate, a submarine, or a Navy SEAL team, or underwater demolition team. Okay. Well, you have anything else to add or anything else? To, well, you, I know you can talk, so <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I... You know, I think it's a real privilege and an honor to, to be among those that have proudly served in the Navy's underwater demolition and Navy SEAL teams. But I can tell you that uh, there is no shortage of men that are volunteering for this type of arduous assignment. Uh, it is truly a privilege and honor to serve, but there's nothing I can imagine uh, having been more exciting and for me wanting to do something in the underwater world and where I not only got to, to uh, scuba dive, closed circuit, open circuit, but I actually became a pilot navigator of many submarines and uh, was free fall qualified to jump this, I jumped this over 25,000 feet, um, night combat loads. And, um, and I have everything that the SEAL teams have done, except for being a sniper, I think I've, I've been able to accomplish. Well, that's great, what a great story. It is, it's, yeah. it's a, what a, and you know, those guys that are coming in now are, you, you may be getting inspired, you know, there's a website that's called SEAL SWIC. That's S-E-A-L SWIC, S-W-C-C, which stands for uh, uh, C uh, Special Warfare Combatant Crew uh, .com. So SEAL SWIC .com, There's a tremendous amount of information there uh, that you need to uh, explore if you're interested. But I can tell you one thing. Got to be a good swimmer. Got to be a good runner. You have to have a positive attitude and be willing to work as a team. Well, that's probably the, the latter two. Certainly having a positive attitude is the key to a lot of things in life. Everything in life yeah. requires yeah. that. And yes, discipline sir. and details, yes, yeah. You well. Have to, you have to believe you're gonna succeed. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Even, yeah. even as a member of the CIA. <laughs> yeah, good. Thank you very much. We welcome you for paying attention to our podcast and uh, the American Security Council Foundation will, podcast will be shown on our website at www.wascf.us. We also post it on social media such as Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, 
Rumble, and there's one more, and I forgot the name, but we, we're out there on social media uh, with the podcast. So look for us on the social media uh, at your convenience. So thank you very much. Good day.